Hi, everybody, and welcome to Veganic Gardeners Question Time. Now than more than ever, it is vital that we engage with how our food is grown. And by growing your own food veganically, you're part of a growing revolution, not only to transform your garden plot, but also to change the way that the world grows its food. So welcome. This is a monthly event that is organized by the Vegan Organic Network, and I am so happy to welcome you here today. Uh, just to introduce myself, my my name is Meg Kelly, uh, and I run Learn Veganic, and I'm also excited to tell you about our upcoming Learn Veganic gardening course, uh, which is starting uh, quite soon. Uh, you can find out more at learnveganic.com, and this is a course that includes uh, seven weeks of Q&A so that we can help answer your gardening questions and offer you personalized advice for your garden. And you can save $15 on the course uh, with the code VON15. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce our panel. But first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Vaughn World Map. Uh, this is a world map that's free to join. So whether you're a gardener or a farmer, uh, you can add yourself to the map to let other people know that you grow in a vegan organic way. Uh, so this map was recently launched. It now has over 150 people on it, uh, including farmers and gardeners and even people who are growing vegan organically on their windowsills. And uh, Vaughn is now launching the Vaughn Map events, and uh, it will feature uh, vegan organic and planet-friendly events that are happening around the world. So if you are interested in hosting an event or going to an event, um, you can keep an eye out on the, Vaughn, uh, on the Vaughn map. And you can also email events at veganorganic.net uh, to, to let people know about events that you may be organizing yourself. And uh, you know, for anyone who's not on the Vegan Organic Network's newsletter yet, I'd really recommend joining that because that's one of the best ways to find out about events that are happening uh, around the world related to vegan organic growing. Uh, so uh, today I'd like to introduce our panel to you. Um, <clears throat> We have two wonderful panelists joining us today to answer your questions about vegan organic growing. Uh, so Pierce Warren is joining us. Pierce is a conservationist, an author, and a keen grower of organic uh, fruits and vegetables. And he is the founder of Wild Eye, which is the International School of Wildlife Filmmaking. And he's the writer of several books, and uh, that includes being the co-author of The Vegan Cook and Gardener, which is both a gardening book and a vegan cookbook uh, that you can buy on the Vegan Organic Network's website. So welcome, Pierce. It's wonderful to have you here with us today. Thanks very much. Yeah, and I'd love to hear a little bit about what steps you're taking in your garden right now. I know it's late March in England. Can you let me know a bit about where you're at with your garden or if there's any steps you're taking in the upcoming weeks? Yes, well, um, I've, I've got some nice little plants of things that we start early, like tomatoes and chilies and peppers and things like that. So they, they started off um, in a heated propagator and then they're, they're now decent sized little plants um, so they will eventually be potted on and move into the into the greenhouse um, meanwhile various other seeds have been sown like onions and kale and radishes and lettuces and things like that but of course it's April next week and April is is the big sowing season so they'll uh, there's a lot to be done then. Um, it's still fairly cool here, actually. It, it's between sort of 10 and 12 degrees centigrade, um, and it's going to be that sort of temperature for the next couple of weeks. So I'm trying not to be impatient and uh, just wait till it warms up a little bit before I do the majority of the sowing outside anyway. All right, Pierce, wonderful. And I'm looking forward to hearing some of your gardening advice that you have. I know we have a lot of great questions today, so I'm looking forward to hearing your insights. And we also have Aranya joining us. Aranya is one of Britain's leading permaculture teachers. Uh, he's the author of the popular book, Permaculture Design, a step-by-step -step guide, which has been translated into five languages. And he's been gardening for 35 years and loves growing food and is especially interested in low input systems like forest gardening and no dig. And you can find out more about Aranya's books and courses by visiting his website, learnpermaculture.com. So welcome Aranya, it's wonderful to have you here today. 
That's all right. Thanks, Meg. And I'd love to hear a bit about what's going on in your gardens right now. Again, you know, very early season. It would be great to hear what yeah. you're up to. Yes, yeah, so quite a lot of overlap with peers in the, you know, there are tomatoes and peppers. And I, the peppers are interesting because last year, all the yellow pointy peppers sort of developed this chili thing. And I'm not really into chilies. And so we had these fantastic peppers that were too hot. So we just give, kept giving them to people. And they're the ones that have germinated this year. So okay. it's, yeah, interesting. But certainly in terms of, yes, planting things early to uh, Last year, I planted squashes later and found they actually did better than trying to start them really early. So you don't have to do everything at once. And <laughs> I think, you know, somebody with green fingers, I think, has someone who's killed a lot of plants and learned what to do, what not to do to kill them next time. So, yes, I would always encourage people to grow things, seeds are cheap, and, uh, you know, you've got nothing to lose, really. So. Absolutely. I often say that, too, that the best gardeners are the ones who killed the most plants, because oftentimes there is that learning process that we go through. And, uh, you know, just, just by getting our hands dirty, giving it a shot, we end up with some plants, we lose a few, and, and we end up learning along the way. So wonderful, Aranya. Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing your insights, hearing some of your answers to these questions. And just to let everyone know, you can also post uh, comments or questions that you have during the show. And sometimes they'll pop up for us. And, and if we're able to address them on the fly, we'll try our best to do that. Uh, so yeah, let, let's see what our first question is here. So the first question is, can you advise on how to start with potted vegetables and herbs to start with, please? Um, so this looks like someone who is just learning how to garden and, and wants to know some easy plants to start out with. And also what types of plants can be harvested multiple times uh, and which plants might come back again or are easy to continue to grow for years to come. So this is a question from Andy Harden. So who would like to jump in on that question? I think that's Piers. Go for it, Piers. <laughs> okay, well, um, perhaps I'll start just by talking about what you're going to grow in, in, in terms of, of containers, because, of course, pots uh, are very expensive these days, um, especially terracotta pots, um, but even plastic pots, if you buy them new, very expensive. But there's lots of ways you can get around this. One is that some garden centres these days, they have outside the centre, they have an area where people can return plastic pots that they don't want anymore. And you can just help yourself to those for free. Um, another thing is to ask your neighbours, because, of course, when a lot of people buy a shrub or a plant and they put it into the ground, then they have these nice big pots spare. And, uh, for example, my next door neighbour, um, a year or so ago, um, asked me if I had any use for some pots that they were going to throw out. And I said, oh, yes, please, I'll, I'll take whatever you've got. And uh, they've now got so used to me accepting whatever is spare that every now and again, they just lob some pots over the fence and um, I put them to good use. So that's that's another thing. Um, and don't forget that any any container um, can be used as long as you can put drainage holes in the bottom. So um, wooden boxes, plastic crates, all of these can be filled with soil and compost to grow in. Yeah. And um, if you go to your local recycling centre, um, there's a section where they sell very cheaply um, things that people have left there. So this can include pots, wooden boxes, things like that that can that can come very cheaply. The next thing is, what are you going to put into these containers? So um, next to my potting bench, I have various sacks of things to use, including multi-purpose compost, horticultural grit, um, topsoil and coir, which I buy in, in blocks and then soak to make, make the coir. And uh, of course, there's my garden compost as well from my own heap. So whenever I'm filling a seed tray or a pot or anything like this, I can choose and make my own mixture from these, these four or five different sources because, of course, different plants have different requirements. And if you're sowing tiny seeds, you might want a different mixture than if you're 
putting a, a, a bigger plant in a pot. So that's what to what to um, how to get the containers and what to fill them with. And and as for the plants, um, perhaps Aranya would like to take over at this point and suggest a few. Yeah, um, Aranya, go yeah. for it. I mean, anything perennial will give you the opportunity to pick and pick again. So, and there are some things, depending on the season as well, because when you're growing something, you're growing a plant for a reason. So if you're growing something for its fruit, you're wanting to sort of support it through that whole process of making flowers, making seeds, making fruits. Whereas when you're basically growing for leaves, then we're trying to slow that process down. And so it also can be about where you put things. So sometimes we often think in Britain that you want to put things in the sun. But when it starts to warm up, if you're growing salads, it's better to have them more in a shady, cooler space because that slows down the flowering. Because once they start flowering, the leaves often get a bit bitter and you can't really pick them anymore. So, but another strategy is successional sowing. So if you put a little note in your diary, the things like lettuces, which you get a lot of seeds if you buy a packet of lettuce seeds, you know, maybe hundreds or a thousand or so. And so it doesn't take much to just sow a little tray of a few seeds every few weeks, and then you grow them on and plant them out. It's a really cheap way of doing things. And of course, when seeds are cheap, you can kill them and not worry about that too much. But yes, there's quite a lot of plants that you can, what we might call pick and pluck. So as long as you don't take too many and you allow the plants sort of, it's finding that balance of allowing the plant to grow a bit, but not have so much energy that it can flower easily. And that's why we talk about things bolting, where they go to seed, when they make flowers, and then you're sort of done. But again, saving seed, if you're that's a whole other thing. Let's not talk about saving seed. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> Massive rabbit hole. I think time for the next question. Yeah, and I'd like to add in here that I am a big fan of planting biennial plants uh, in pots. Um, with There are some types of annual plants like lettuce that, as Aranya mentioned, they have a tendency to bolt. So lettuce is an absolutely wonderful thing to grow in a pot, but one of the issues is at some point during the season, it's going to decide to make its flowers and its seeds. And at that point, you kind of lose the lettuce, um, I, I, you know, what, once it goes to flower or seed. Um, whereas if you have something like a kale plant or a collard plant, those are biennials. So they actually live for kind of two seasons. And so in their first season, they have no biological inclination to go to flower or to go to seed, which means that if you plant a kale plant in the month of March, for example, you could still be harvesting from that in November, in December, even throughout the winter, even the following spring. So um, as long as you just take a few leaves off your collard plant or your kale plant, you can basically harvest from the same plant for months and months and months and months on end. Um, you can also grow perennial plants in pots, which will come back year after year. It's just a little bit tougher. Uh, sometimes uh, perennials will survive much better in the ground than they do in pots, but you can certainly try things uh, like um, chives or oregano. There's a decent chance that they'll survive in pots over uh, the winter in England. Um, so I'm, I'm a huge fan of those plants where you plant them and you get several months or several years of harvesting from them. So now we'll move on to our next question and let's find out. Uh, so this is a question from Andrea. And Andrea says, how can we make sure the seeds that we are buying are part of a caring network and not mass produced with links to environmental and social exploitation? So that's a wonderful question, Andrea. I'm happy to answer this one, but I'll just ask first if Aranya or Pierce has anything that you'd like to like to share for this. Um, I could just wave a couple of seed packets. Wonderful. <laughs> because of course, depending on where you are in the world would determine what seed companies there are. But um, I've got a few here. There's Vital Seeds, which is Devon. We're in Cornwall, so that's close to us. They're really good. I mean, essentially, you know, the, I suppose the biggest seed company that heads, you know, organic gardening. There was a sort of biodynamic seed company called the Seed Cooperative, but sadly they've stopped. So I've still got some of their seeds. Um, the Vital Seeds, Real Seeds is also another one. Uh, some lovely people in Wales. So basically, there's there's quite a lot of small seed companies. They're all you know 
couples sometimes just doing this important work and i'm sure wherever you are in the world it's just yeah finding somebody looking yeah i recommendations real seeds vital seeds definitely in the uk Wonderful. And I do want to mention that there are a few veganic seed companies and to the degree that we're able to support them, it's a wonderful thing to do. Uh, many of you have heard of farmer Jimmy Videli. He wrote the Veganic Growers Handbook uh, and he's actually a veganic seed producer. So his farm, it's actually in Quebec. So the, the name of the farm is in French. It's called La Ferme de l'Aube. And uh, he actually ships veganic seeds around the world uh, to, to most countries. Um, there's also in Canada one called Seed saving.ca. Um, and I, in the UK, there's a small seed company called Beans and Herbs. And the seeds that they produce themselves are veganically grown. They also sell some seeds from other seed producers. So if you want to find out which ones are veganic, you kind of have to, to contact them and ask. But I'd also just like to mention that in general, if you see the word organic on a seed package, that's always a really good sign that you're supporting a good seed company. Um, and I also like to look for the words heirloom or open pollinated, because usually those two words will indicate that you could still save the seeds year after year after year and get a the similar result. Um, personally, I avoid buying seeds that are hybrid. Uh, there's not necessarily anything too wrong with hybrid seeds. They can produce some very, very good results. And there are sometimes reasons why we might choose them. But one of the issues with hybrid seeds is you can't save the seeds after. If you save the seeds from a hybrid tomato, for example, the next year you'll just kind of get random results when you plant them. So I like to get heirloom or open pollinated seeds because then I can actually become a seed saver myself and keep that variety alive in my own garden. Uh, so those are my recommendations. And just to say, if you ever open a seed package and the seeds are really odd colors, like bright green or bright blue or something like that, that's an indication that it has some pesticides or herbicides added directly on the seed. It's very rare that you'll see that, but uh, occasionally there might be some seed companies that sell seeds like that. So if you see, if they look like candy when you open the seed package and they look really weird, don't use seeds like that. But, but it's rare that you'll run into that issue. And Pierce, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add or if not, we can move on to the next question here. Well, obviously the first choice is to save your own seed and then you really do know where it's come from. Uh, but I also just want to mention there is in the UK, a heritage seed library where mm -hmm. you can buy um, heritage seeds open pollinated, as you've just mentioned. And that's run by the organization Garden Organic. So you have to join Garden Organic and then you pay a little bit extra to join the heritage seed library. And then you get um, free seeds as part of that. So check them out. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Pierce and Armania. And let's move on to the next question and see what we can help someone with here. So I have several nice avocado plants that I grew from the seeds last year. They have overwintered fine indoors. I do have a greenhouse in the garden. What are the chances of them ever fruiting in the UK? So this is something we've done ourselves before where we've had uh, an avocado seed that has sprouted in our compost bin. And then we thought, well, let's just plant it inside. And I can say that in Canada here, all we ever get is a, a nice little indoor house plant. And, and that's as good as it gets. We're never going to get any avocado fruit here. But let's hear from Pierce and Aranya regarding what your predictions are for these plants in the UK. <laughs> all right, you've got yeah. a thumbs down. It, it's not very good news. Yeah, no. I mean, the, an avocado plant, before it starts fruiting, it's probably going to have to be at least 10 years old and several meters tall. So to do that in, in the UK where, where um, Simon is, you'd have to have a pretty big greenhouse or conservatory mm -hmm. that is, um, is heated and quite humid and to wait at least 10 years. Um, so it's pretty unlikely. Most people don't have those sort of uh, conditions here. So, um, but as you say, they make great house plants. So, so just keep them for that. Yeah, I, I would, <laughs> you probably would need to graft also use it as a rootstock and graft on a sort of high mountain variety that will cope with colder temperatures generally avocados like cherimoyas sadly i grew a cherimoya from seed last year and it just got a bit of cold and it's sprouting from the stump but basically pretty much everything it grew last year has died back 
and that's just what they do and if they don't get big enough to fruit you're never going to get fruit so it looks nice when it's small but it's not going to get big <laughs> yeah and, and this comes back to the idea that the more that we grow uh, plants that are really adapted to our own climate, the easier it's going to be. Uh, I know that there are some people who will try to kind of push the limits of their own climates, but mm -hmm. often it becomes uh, a, a really big input of fossil fuels in order to kind of keep you know, the light conditions and the heat conditions that are necessary. So at that point, just importing that food can often be much more ecologically friendly rather than trying to grow something kind of out of season or, or in the wrong uh, climate. And we have so many wonderful fruit trees that do grow in cooler climates. Uh, you know, there's apple trees, pear trees, and, and so many others. Uh, and there's a bunch of nut trees that we can grow too if we want something that is kind of fattier like an avocado. Uh, so I would really encourage you as much as possible to grow things that are well adapted because you're going to have more success with that. So let's move on to our next question here. So we have a question from Claire Vinters, and I know Claire, so let's see what she has to ask. And Claire says, I would really appreciate any information on ridding my pear tree of scab. It has had it for four years out of the five that she's had the tree, and Claire has read that she could use fixed copper or Bordeaux mixtures or copper soaps or sulfur or mineral or neem oils as a way of treating it. And Claire's wondering if any of us have advice regarding this. She doesn't want to give up on the tree, but the pears are inedible due to the scab. I really want to use a vegan organic pro uh, approach, and uh, at present the fruit is inedible. So I feel for Claire here because I personally have a pear tree that does not have scab, and I can tell you it is a wonderful thing to have a pear tree that keeps giving pears year after year without presenting us with any problems. But because my pear tree is personally doing absolutely A-OK, -okay, I don't have any direct advice for Claire on how to deal with this one. So Aranya or Pierce, do either of you have any advice for Claire here? Well, uh, this scab is a fungal disease, so it's spread via airborne spores, um, which is a, which which could be a problem that even if you got your tree healthy, if your neighbours have got a tree with scab, the spores could just blow over and reinfect it. But um, let, let's be positive and, and assume that's not the case. Um, first thing that you have to do is to clear up all around the tree, make sure there are no um, old fruits or leaves from last year. So gather them all up and put them put them in a plastic bag in the bin. Don't put them on your compost heap. Um, next, you want to prune out any blistered twigs that have been affected by the scab. Ideally, you would have done this a few months ago, but it's still worth doing it now. If you see twigs that are affected by the scab, prune them off and again, throw them away and um, just see if the, if the tree recovers better this year. Well, thank you so much, Piers. And Aranya, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Uh, that's fine. That's great. Wonderful. <laughs> so let's move on to the next question here. So uh, the question is from Susie in Cornwall. Can you recommend companion planting strategies that can be employed in March and April to maximize garden productivity and deter pests naturally? So what can we do in terms of planting plants close together in order to have better productivity uh, or to deter pests. Aranya or Pierce, you're welcome to jump in. An obvious one that springs to mind for me because we have uh, voles that live in our garden. They're very cute, uh, little stubby things. And uh, our garden sits on top of, obviously they converted the barns, they threw all the concrete and then put a bit of earth on top. So this is lovely warren underneath that they can live in and they pop up and uh, voles do like to eat sometimes fruit tree roots and so for us we plant around our fruit trees we plant a couple of things that voles and other rodents who nibble roots don't like the smell of and it keeps them away and one of those things is daffodils so when you see daffodils in orchards they weren't just planted to be pretty they were there for a practical reason around the trees to protect the trees and another one is mint and uh, we, when we first came across this issue, 
I just got some mint and I shoved it upside down. I just I wasn't thinking put mint around the tree because of course it can spread if you're. So I just put this mint in upside down and it just rooted. So um, we sort of planted mint by just shoving a bit in the hole, but it's doing the job. And so in terms of what we might call a guild around a tree, which is a kind of form of companion planting, because we're looking at what's the functional support that this tree needs. And that could be all kinds of things like pollination or uh, pest control, pest predator attraction or nitrogen fixation and so on. Uh, so we start with functions and then we think about what can we what can we grow or you know animals pet animals rescue animals can also be part of a system like this um so that there are pheasants nearby that wander through from time to time and ground feeding birds will eat the like the hazelnut hazelnut weevil larvae and also pear midge larvae which um over winter around the bottom of the tree so they can be part of that system as well even if you they just turn up and they're not something that you put into your system so yeah yes and uh, maybe Piers has some things to talk about sort of practical veg companions or something well of course this this is the time of year that we're thinking about where we're going to grow things in our garden this year or on our allotment plot and um, so it might be an idea if you don't plant closely together plants that have the same sort of pests. So, for example, members of the brassica family like cabbages and kale, etc. You might want to plant them away from each other so that pests don't go from one to the other. Or, or if the, let's say, the, the white butterflies are, go and visit your cabbages, if the kale are right next to them, then they'll, they'll lay on that as well. Um, so this does go slightly against the system of crop rotation, where you might expect to put all your brassicas in one bed and then all your um, root crops in another bed, for example. Um, but I find that sometimes intercropping, which is where you dot things around more, um, can be more effective. And don't forget that some crops um, can be very ornamental as well. So chard for example is a very beautiful plant and, and that can be dotted around in your flower borders same with leeks and things like that and then you can um, harvest them when you like and they're less likely to to get pests other than that this is also the time of year for sowing seeds so um, good idea to sow all the useful plants like um, mint as, as was just mentioned also um, marigolds nasturtiums basil these are all plants which either repel um, pests or will attract them so for example i always grow loads of nasturtiums because of, apart from the fact that they're beautiful you can eat the leaves and the flowers they're good for for pollinating insects they also attract um, green fly black fly aphids and when they do that, I'd rather they were on the nasturtiums than on some of the, the other crops that I'm growing. And of course, once you do have aphids, don't panic because the, the presence of the aphids will bring in the predators like the ladybirds and the lacewings who will keep the population under control. It's when you try and completely eradicate a pest that you can, you can come a cropper later when, when they infest. Wonderful, Pierce. And, and I also want to mention that there are ways that we can be strategic to maximize harvests uh, by thinking about what we can plant uh, before the final frosts, uh, when we have areas of our garden, you know, that are tend to be empty, because there are some plants like tomatoes and peppers uh, and cucumbers and squash that we actually have to wait until all danger of frost has passed before we put them out in our garden. And that can mean that early in the season, we have areas of our garden that are pretty much bare, uh, but there are some plants that we can plant quite early on that are frost tolerant that actually give harvests after just a few weeks. So some examples are radish and spinach, um, but also some of the cruciferous greens like uh, bok choy, or even if you did something like kale or collards, but just as baby kale and collards, not actually trying to get the whole mature plant. Um, with, with plants like that, you know, you can do the seeds directly outdoors, even when there's still danger of frost. And you can get harvests after maybe something like six weeks or seven weeks. Um, so I would recommend 
filling in some of those areas with your of your garden with these you know very quick to harvest uh, plants. And you know when it's time to uh, plant, for example, your tomatoes or your peppers, uh, you can just you know clear out those plants at that time to make some room uh, for your warm weather plants. So that's a great way to have. It's not exactly companion planting, but it's kind of successive planting in order to make the most of our garden space. So I let's, have, uh, one, yeah. one more quick one. To, so, so what what I always do in the garden at this time of year is I don't harvest all of the carrots and all of the parsnips. So let at least two or three of them go to flower. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have them in your garden, you can just buy a parsnip or a carrot and stick it in the ground because that's what it's wanting to do now is to flower. And those flowers will attract uh, things like the, the soldier beetles as they're called in a polite sense. And, uh, and they're really good pest predators in the garden. So I yeah, do that. Wonderful. That's the first time I've seen someone recommend buying a carrot to stick in your garden in the spring. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> so wonderful, Aranya. Very, uh, very direct advice for people who are trying to get some beneficial insects in their garden. Wonderful. So let's move on to our next question here. So hi, Vaughn, and thanks for the show. I'd really like to grow mushrooms veganically, chestnut being my favorite, but I don't know how to or what medium to use. Does the panel have experience in this? So this is a question from Jane. Uh, so I've, I've had a little bit of experience growing oyster mushrooms. I can't necessarily speak too much about other types of mushrooms, but I will say that oyster mushrooms are one of the easiest types of mushrooms to grow. So if you are thinking of getting started, I'd personally recommend to anyone, if you're getting started with mushrooms, start with oyster mushrooms. Let's start with one of the easiest ones so that we can try to have success. And one of the best things we can do to start out is quite simply to buy a kit from, from a, you know, an experienced, um, you know, mushroom uh, kit uh, uh, company because you know there are places where we can just buy a kit that we can bury in our garden or that we can bury in a pot. Uh, growing mushrooms is extremely different from regular gardening. There's other things to keep in, in mind like trying not to have it become contaminated because you know if, if we get certain types of uh, I, insects on it and things like that, that, you know, the mycelium can get eaten. So I would really recommend to people, you know, go and spend $40 on a kit that's ready to go, bury it in your garden according to the manufacturer's instructions, do what they say to do, and try to have success your first time out. Because it is a little bit discouraging if we try to be very elaborate with what we're doing, if we try to spend a lot of money, if we try to kind of extend the material out. Sometimes it's good to have a good first experience and then to say, okay, the next year, can I learn a little bit more in order to kind of, you know, get an even bigger harvest from this. But Aranya or Pierce, if you have something you'd like to add, I'd love to hear about your experience too. Yeah, I, <laughs> I definitely uh, second the whole oyster mushroom thing um, because they're quite, they are vigorous, aggressive mushrooms and they will outcompete. If you've got anything in the substrate that's already got in, then they will compete strongly and you know, ultimately whoever's in first in the mushroom world or the fungal world is the winner. Um, the Yes, getting into mushrooms also can be a bit of a rabbit hole and you can end up like some people I know with, you know, these clean rooms and all kinds of expensive ventilation and stuff, but you can do it at a very simple level. Uh, one really nice sort of natural way is to get logs, but they need to be freshly cut logs but kept off the ground for a few weeks so that the natural fungicides within the tree decay and don't kill the, the inoculant that you're putting in. Um, there's a really good company, the best one that I've come across at the moment because Ann Miller sadly retired after about 30 years so now the best place I found in the UK is gourmet woodland mushrooms and they're very good and they'll provide yes lots of things like oysters, different kinds of oysters, but gray oysters, the sort of standard ones are easy to start with. You can get into the whole plastic bag thing, which again, for me is a bit mm, plastic bags. Uh, and then there's buckets, whereas logs, you know, a log is a log, or there's another um, species called King Strafaria, which is the wine cap, which is a really big mushroom and that grows on wood chip. So if you can get some fairly fresh wood chip and just lay that down and you can do cardboard and wood chip layers, 
And there's a company called Grow Cycle, I think it's based in Bristol. They've got lots of really good web um, videos online, including about how to do that, but also, and they do kits. So as Meg said, you can buy kits from them as well, but it's all very educational, very exciting. Um, and much easier to grow mushrooms that consume dead material, like whereas mycorrhizal mushrooms, which I think is another question coming up, they're much more difficult to manage because with a log, once the fungus has eaten the log or got to the end of the log, then it has to fruit because it's run out of space. Whereas mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, they just keep on going. So it's much more difficult to control that fruiting process. So yes, oyster is, micro, is uh, saprotrophic. So start with oysters and yeah, get the bug. <laughs> Pierce, do you have anything you'd like to add in? Uh, yes, just to mention one other company, which is called Merry Hill, and they specialize in uh, mushroom kits. They've been doing this for, for many years, and they, they definitely supply a chestnut mushroom kit. So I recommend starting off with that. Um, if, if you want then to move on, there, there are lots of books out there just about growing mushrooms, which are really useful. But essentially, you'll want to create um, a bed of organic material, which can include coffee grounds and wood chips and shredded paper and compost and things like that. Make a nice uh, mixture. And then you need to inoculate it with the um, with the fungus. So you do need to be able to buy a vial of spores um, if it's if it's chestnut mushrooms, which aren't always easy to obtain. Um, but which is why a lot of people start with others like oysters, which which are easier. But um, yeah, definitely give give chestnut mushrooms via Mary Hill a go. And um, just beware that chestnut mushroom is the name of two different species. So if you want to get the chestnut mushrooms that you can commonly buy in a supermarket here, make sure you're getting the right one. Thanks, Pierce. And I want to mention too that sometimes there are uh, uh, different types of like trainings that we can take, you know, classes that might be available in your local area. Uh, you know, if you do find a local producer of mycelium, you can find out if they have any classes available. Because again, learning how to grow mushrooms, very different from gardening. There's a lot of new things to learn. And sometimes there will even be classes where over the course of a class, you'll actually inoculate a few logs together and then bring those logs home and things like that. So I'd really suggest looking into some of the resources that are available that will make it easier for you as you're starting out. So let's move on to our next question here. So can Veganic feed the world? And are there examples of large scale Veganic farms? So this is a question from Debbie. And this is a huge question about whether Veganic can feed the world. And, and in some ways, it's a question that's hard to definitively answer <laughs> in a, in a, in a uh, era where most farms at the moment are not veganic. Um, but one thing I would just like to point out is that when we ask questions about whether something can feed the world, we have to also recognize that right now with industrial agriculture, we can ask the question, is industrial agriculture feeding the world? And yes, it's feeding some people in the world, but not others. And so when we ask questions like, can something feed the world? I think we have to recognize that there are a lot of people in today's system who aren't necessarily being fed properly. And oftentimes that has actually more to do with how food is distributed and access to food uh, than it does with which agricultural technique is used. Um, I also would like to mention that in our current agricultural system, uh, there's typically several calories of fossil fuel energy in order to produce one calorie of food. And so uh, right now with you know, the chemical, the nitrogen that's being frequently used uh, and also you know, the, the massive use of machinery in our current agricultural technique, Sometimes there might be 10 or 20 calories of fossil fuel energy that's used to produce one calorie of food. So when we ask the question right now, is our current agricultural system sustainable? 
The answer is no. And it's actually hard to see how we could keep going indefinitely with our current agricultural system. Uh, we also have an agricultural system right now that while it is feeding many of us, uh, for the most part, it's also degrading topsoil much faster than topsoil is being produced. Uh, so right now we have an agricultural system that's uh, in a lot of ways selling out the ability of future generations to feed themselves. So I think what we need to do is start from that question of, what is a style of agriculture that's actually going to be sustainable in the long term? And then uh, can it produce uh, a decent number of calories per acre? And when we look, for example, at Ian Tolhurst's farm, which is about 20 acres, it's producing a, a quite a decent amount of food per acre while using about 90% less fossil fuels than the average farm and while increasing the quality of the soil. So for me, that's the type of agriculture that we need if we want to be able to feed the world going forward and we want to be able to feed the world for generations to come. Uh, I know that on Jimmy Videli's farm in Canada, uh, he actually weighs all of his produce. And so he was able to compare the harvests on his farm to the, uh, you know, per acre compared to other types of farms. And he has very good yields per acre. Um, so, um, I think it's just, you know, a question of just converting one farm at a time and making sure that as we convert farms that they stay productive uh, and that they're actually building up topsoil and becoming more sustainable than current farms. Uh, also, just to mention, there are quite a number of farms that are essentially veganic on a larger scale um, without necessarily intending to be. So uh, if, for example, there's a farm that produces a lot of grains and a lot of legumes in an organic way, um, sometimes farms like that simply won't have access to large amounts of manure or other types of animal products. Uh, so there are absolutely some large grain and legume farms that are veganic essentially by default, just because it was just quite simply easier in that context to maintain fertility with plant-based techniques. So I think we can look to, to many different farms. And we have a little question that just popped up from Jenny that I'll just ask for Aranya. Aranya, can you remind us of the name of the, the first company that you mentioned? I believe it might've been perhaps in terms of mushrooms, perhaps in terms of seeds. So Aranya, maybe we can hear from okay. you again <laughs> regarding your advice. Okay, so seeds, I said Vital Seeds, V-I-T-A-L. Um, and the, the fungal company is growing, uh, sorry, Gourmet Woodland Mushrooms. Okay, wonderful. Gourmet. So Jenny, I hope one of those was what you were looking for. And Aranya and Pierce, do you have anything that you would like to add about the capacity of, of vegan organic agriculture to feed the world or to feed even a community? It doesn't even have to be the world. It can be a country, it can be a community. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, for me, I thought you covered it really well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll just add then that um, um, my short answer to the question is yes, um, but of course we need um, a huge number of smaller farms and a lot more people working on them. Um, so, for example, if you take an allotment and you compare that to your average arable field here producing crops, then then per per area of land, the allotment will be far more productive in terms of calorie and healthful produce. And by the way, recent studies have shown that allotments are the most biodiverse regions, even more than gardens and definitely more than farmland. So they're um, really valuable. So we, we, I think we'll have to think in, in terms of, of quite small farms um, like Tolhurst Organics and even smaller um, that have a number of people working on them and that are, are producing lots of healthy produce for local people. I think that that's the key. And we just had a comment that popped up where someone was mentioning biocyclic farms, and that's also another wonderful one to bring up. Uh, so there are quite a number of certified biocyclic farms and biocyclic is very, very similar to vegan organic. Uh, and it, it tends to be a bit more popular on mainland Europe, uh, but also in other countries too. And uh, there are uh, numerous examples of biocyclic farms that are producing grains and legumes and fruits and veggies on, on a larger scale. So thank you for bringing that up. 
And Danny also mentioned One Degree Farms. One Degree is a company uh, in North America that makes grains and legumes and breakfast cereals and bread and things like that, where the farms grow in a vegan organic way. And many of those farms, yes, are, are uh, wonderful examples of larger scale vegan organic growing. So let's see what our next question is. I think this might be our last question as, as we finish up here. So we have a question from Simon in Essex who says, as a vegan, I love eating nuts, but I've never tried growing my own. Can the panel suggest which varieties are suitable for a garden in East England? So Aranya or Pierce, do you have any recommendations for nuts that you might grow yourself or that you might recommend for him? Um, I'll, I'll just quickly mention the three I'd go for, which is hazelnuts, almonds, and walnuts. Um, in each case, um, you know, if you're starting with, with small plants, you're going to have to wait a few years <laughs> before you actually get to harvest any. And particularly with hazels, you'll need to be careful of, of squirrels. Um, but if, if, you've got, if you've got the time and the space, I'd, I'd recommend trying all three of those. Wonderful. Aranya, yeah. any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, just worth um, looking at Martin. what Martin Crawford has been doing with the Agroforestry Research Trust. Now, he's based in Devon, which is obviously a bit wetter than uh, where exactly are you again? I think it said so in southeast England or something, east England. So, yes, but he's been trying lots of different varieties from, you know, across Europe and so on in, or, or in order to work out what's, which of those varieties do well here in Britain. And so I would definitely look at his website and his he's written loads of books about forest gardens and that kind of thing. Um, he's definitely and there's a book. He actually has a book about growing nuts, <laughs> nut trees. So that would be ideal, I would say. Fantastic. And I'm also going to give another thumbs up for hazelnuts here. Uh, hazelnuts are a little bit smaller than some of the other nut trees, so you can get more of them in uh, to, to the same space. Uh, and with hazelnuts, you might want to put several hazelnut plants on, on your property because when you have increased cross-pollination, there's more chance of getting increased harvests. And again, as Pierce was mentioning, how squirrels can often enjoy eating the hazelnuts before you get to them. So again, the more you plant, the more you're likely to get. Uh, so I would just like to thank both of our panelists for joining us today. Thank you, Aranya. Thank you, Pierce. It's been wonderful hearing all of your recommendations uh, and, and helping people get a good start to their gardening season. And I'd also like to mention uh, that you can join and support the work of the Vegan Organic Network and get a copy of the wonderful magazine, Growing Green International, which is full of stories, advice, and information. And you can get this by uh, visiting the website veganorganic.net. And also when you sign up for the newsletter, you're going to be able to stay in the loop uh, and hear about all the wonderful events that are coming up, uh, including the monthly uh, Veganic Gardener's Question Time and plus other events events uh, that, that are coming up in the coming months. Um, and please remember to like and subscribe to our channel. And I hope everybody has a wonderful day. And thank you so much for joining us.